All right. So RapidJet, a fast dynamic systems programming language. So first off, hi, I'm Max. Uh, I'm an open source systems hacker. Uh, I'm currently dabbling in high performance networking applications. And I suppose I should start with a quick rundown of Lua, just in case you don't know it. Um, Lua is a simple, minimalistic, high level language. Uh, it has like a schemish semantics and a Pascal esque syntax. It has first class functions, uh, multiple return values, prototype based object orientation, and it's surprisingly flexible. And its central data structure is the table, which is a hybrid between a hash map and a sparse array. And the canonical implementation of Lua is called PUCLUA, which is uh, a simple embeddable interpreter intended to be embedded in C and C++ applications, among others. So here's an extended hello world to get you kind of familiar with the language. I'm not going to explain anything about it. I'm just going to let you stare at it a little bit and hope that's somewhat obvious. So Lua JIT is an alternative implementation of Lua. Uh, it implements a dialect of Lua 5.1 and a half ish, uh, plus some extra goodies. That's why I'm saying it's a dialect, not just an older version. Um, as its name suggests, it comes with the just in time compiler. And that compiler is really, really impressive and achieves performance competitive with C. Uh, it's also a really good language for expressing programs that are close to the metal, uh, thanks to its. Uh, built-in language support for accessing and operating on C data. And that I think personally that LuaJIT is a good systems language. Systems language here, I mean that it's um, a good language to replace C. Like uh, an application that you would have pri previously written in C, you could also write in LuaJIT, and you would get very far with that. So here's an example of some LuaJIT code showing off its ability to poke at low-level data. Um, so you can see here that the language has um, built-in primitives for expressing the C data, such as C structs. And you can access that data and the fields as if they were native Lua objects. Um, to illustrate that, for instance, if P here was instead a Lua table with um, containing a string or containing a C array uh, and a Lua number, the code here wouldn't change at all. You could still access it the same way, and you could still copy to the uh, C array contained in the Lua table. So RaptorJIT is a fork of LuaJIT, and its goal is to be a really good systems programming language. Um, with RaptorJIT, we want to do a couple of things. Uh, first, we want to simplify the implementation and improve maintainability. Um, we also want to improve the compiler um, for heavy-duty server applications specifically. So we have a very narrow use case. We want to write systems uh, applications, like we're systems hackers, and we want to create a systems language. And we have a more narrow set of, um, yeah, I guess, optimization targets. And we think that we can improve the compiler even more um, by targeting this uh, narrow use case. Um, especially, we want to eliminate performance pitfalls, meaning small changes that have big, big impact on performance, and um, as well as uh, unexpected JIT behavior. So we want to make it more easy to understand the JIT compiler and to use it. And under the bottom line, we want to um, provide more reliable performance. So. Right now, Lua performance is, Lua JIT performance is great. We just want to make it more reliable and maybe even better in some, in some cases. Um, right, RaptorJIT also adds new features. Uh, among those is a low overhead uh, profiler and a matching introspection tools for that data. And hopefully, there are many more features to come. And that's where you come in, I guess. 
So, in order to simplify and maintain the code, we are doing, oops, sorry. In order to simplify and maintain the code, we are doing a big spring clean. So here's this pull request titled, Big Bang, remove all the features that I can live without. Uh, and yeah, it says merged. That's the purple icon on the left there. Um, it removed support for all architectures except x86-64 because at the moment that's the only thing we care about and it's enough work maintaining one architecture. Uh, it removed Windows support and it removed Lua's 32-bit heap mode. Um, and this allowed us to get rid of a lot of if devs. We're trying to get rid of all if devs because we don't like if devs. And that resulted in a total code reduction of roughly 50%, which I think is a big win. The Lua JIT interpreter used to be handwritten assembly um, duplicated for each specific architecture. And we have almost completed rewriting that virtual machine interpreter in C and hope that that will make it easier to port and change the language implementation, that is. And the rationale behind this change is that we spend most of our runtime in compiled code, meaning in, in traces, in compiled traces. Um, so for our use cases, high performance networking, um, spending any significant time in interpreted code uh, is out of the question anyway, because that would be way too slow. So for us, an interpreter that's fast doesn't really do anything. We really don't need an interpreter that's like heavily optimized. So our idea is that, look, we're going to make it easier to, to maintain, and we're going to um, skip the optimizations that we don't benefit from. And instead, we want to make it more easier for your code to stay compiled and not fall back into the interpreter. So we're also looking to remove complex optimizations that don't carry their own weight anymore. So here we removed a special case fast pass for string interning. And on the next slide here, I'm paraphrasing from the pull request, which somewhat reads, uh, this fast pass, in air quotes, was bad because it was a tricky custom mem compare routine that needs to be maintained. Uh, it turned out to be slower than the stock mem compare on modern x86 which was the slow path. And it led to confusing performance behavior where uh, unrelated memory allocation could bias often use buffer to the fast pass, again, the fast pass, and uh, impact overall performance. So in the description, Luke concludes that the fast pass code was written 10 years ago and a lot, ha and a lot has happened since then. And he goes on into how the CPU architecture the operating system that is Linux in our case, and even compilers like GCC had really evolved in that time, and goes on to say that uh, I think the optimization had simply bit rotted. So what I want to stress here is five. Okay. What I want to stress here is that um, this is not to bash this uh, individual optimization or anything. It's just to say that if you have optimizations that are kind of smart and, and try to outperform certain components in your in your system. Uh, you have to account for the cost of maintaining them and the work of continuously verifying that they still actually work and still actually make your program faster or just that weight. Okay, so I'm running a little bit out of time here. Um, right, so RaptorJIT wants to improve the JIT compiler. Um, to, to understand the setting here, I guess I should explain that Lua JIT acts as a drop-in replacement for Puck Lua. So it has a really fast JIT compiler, and it also has a freely fast interpreter. So if the JIT compiler for some reason fails to compile a code path, it will drop into an interpreter that is still uh, many times slower, uh, sorry, many times faster than the default Lua implementation, canonical Lua implementation. So in any case, if you have a Lua program that you use with Puck Lua, um, you're going to have big uh, imp performance improvements if you run it with Lua JIT, and so you're going to be happy. Um, and we think that we can do better for a narrow set of use cases with RaptorJIT. So to summarize here, that Lua JIT is for existing Puck Lua code bases, and RaptorJIT is for new Lua applications written with a just-in-time compiler in mind. So 
So in case you don't know how a tracing just in time compiler works, I will give you a super reduced explanation. A tracing JIT interprets code. Uh, when it hits a branch, it checks if it's hot or not. If it's not hot, it increments a hot count for that branch in continuous interpretation. However, when the branch is hot, it starts recording a trace. And then again, continuous interpretation after recording a trace. And the next time we would hit a branch, which is not shown here, because it's very simplified, um, eventually, instead of hitting hot branches, you would start hitting, uh, executing traces of hot code. So with WebDigit, instead of treating the compiler like a special source that you uh, throw into your Lua programs to make them magically faster, we want to foster a culture of understanding the JIT compiler. And with that understanding, we want to formulate design goals and implement them. And this should, in turn, again, make the JIT compiler easier to understand and, most importantly, easier to leverage. And the issue referred below here talks about avoiding high-impact medium generality optimizations. Uh, I touched on this before. So a high-impact medium generality optimization is, uh, we, call, we call problems uh, this term if they have the following behavior. So if you make a small change to your program and you get a big change to performance, that's what we call a high-impact medium generality optimization because it's not general um, enough for you to make, freely make changes to your program that are like relevant in, 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 in scale and scope. Um, but it's high impact because you get a big hit if you, if you fall off that optimized path. Uh, and that is how we want to, uh, that is why we want to un avoid unreliable compiler behavior where small changes to your program cause big changes to performance. So Lua just aggressively blacklists code paths and fails to compile. Um, that favors the small, short running programs. Um, our programs, the programs that we target are all long running. So, um, just as a policy change, we spend way more time trying to find good traces, and we're good with that. Um, we just want to make sure that we find the best traces for the program because we know that it's going to long, run for a long time. Um, yeah, as a first step in that direction, we updated the just-in-time compiler's heuristics for trace selection to match our target workloads. And um, yeah, not going to go much into that. On another note, LuaJIT doesn't actually con consider the time domain when selecting traces. So a branch could become hot because it was executed for the hundredth time uh, after an hour of runtime. So the hotness is not actually frequency, but rather this abstract idea of some counter that at some point overflows. And I think that's really unintuitive behavior. I think that maybe RaptorJIT should consider the time domain and only compile code which is actually executed frequently. Uh, we did some experience with that. The results so far were positive, but that's just to show you the kind of hacking that we're doing on that fork. Right, um, we also added new features. We added a low overhead profiler. The intention is to have that profiler always turned on. It will always collect profiling data, even in your, perform uh, even in your production applications, which you can then grab while it's running and display in this front end that we wrote to find which traces take the most time and what's the problem and see how they got created. This is to show that the tool that we wrote is a very visual tool. So this is a dependency graph of the uh, immediate representation instructions um, where you can see, ah, oh, this is the loop body and this is the head that's executed before entering the loop. Um, yeah, there's lots of experimentation going on. Uh, we've experimented with a trace barrier primitive uh, that kind of like stops traces from going over that line of code and forces a new trace to be created, if at all. Uh, we like that one. We experimented with a JIT unlikely primitive, which uh, too long to explain now. We didn't like it. And one thing I guess I want to touch on is that this JIT seal primitive, uh, what this would basically allow you to do is declare or constify a table at runtime. And that would kind of give the compiler a superpower where it could treat um, tables created after configuration changes as constant and optimized based on those contents. Um, Actually, just a few minutes left, so if you want to take some questions. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this one's important. I just have to mention it like in a minute. Um, this is something that Lua Vela has apparently already implemented and something we're really interested in because it removes another high impact medium generality optimization. I guess. Uh, Check out the slides if you want to know more about that. 
Um, right, there's, there's, in general, to JIT compilers, there's new literature, new, new science happening um, that really fixes some basic things. We could implement those things, and we're open to experimenting with that. And yeah, one of my personal goals would be to have safe foreign function memory access, where, because all the information for foreign types, meaning C data, low level data, um, we have all the type information for that available at runtime. So there's like nothing that really stands in between us making that type safe. And uh, the compiler is really good at optimizing these checks, so that's something that I would like to do. Right. So thank you for your attention. Uh, please get involved. We are on GitHub. And yeah. I would. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would be pleased if you, if I got some of you interested in this project at all. So if you like into JIT hacking, um, I think this is a cool place to start. And yeah, if you have any questions, please. Yes. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, maybe some bug fixes, um, but I, I'm not aware. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we have a very very um, specific goal, and we're we're willing to separate and split. Like we want to cooperate with the other forks and change exchange ideas, but we're really open to just like going wild on it. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, um, I think so. So when I started working with the RaptorJet project, I actually wasn't aware of Luavella, but I just recently reread some of the presentations and slide, and to me it seems that they're, they are very similar in spirit, and they have some very specific features that they both want the same thing. And I think, I hope that in the future there will be like a strong collaboration between these two projects, because some things that we want are already implemented in Luavella, and maybe the other way around even. I think that Luavella wants, for example, to have also try out the C interpreter, stuff like that, yeah. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Leave the microphone. Yes. Yeah, okay, please.